Good morning and Merry Christmas to you. And we're getting a little bit of snow outside, so it's starting to feel a little bit more Christmas-like. Just before I get started this morning, I would like to uh, just have a prayer for a lot of our college students who this is a very challenging week for. So would you just bow with me this morning? Uh, Father, the, the academic demands, especially right now, are pretty high and, quite honestly, uh, fairly stressful and exhausting. And it can feel like if uh, performance is, does not exceed expectations, that it could affect future things. Um, would you give all of our college students uh, the strength and the attention span they need to diligently study? Would you help them confidently walk in, whether they're um, taking exams or writing papers or completing projects? And would you help each and every one of them rest when they lay down? so that they feel refreshed when they get up, and that whether they meet their expectations or fail to meet them, that their trust would be that their future belongs to you and not just the outcome of a test or paper. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're, uh, believe it or not, the 14th week in Matthew, and uh, we're moving right along. And Jesus has been, up to this point, uh, he, he taught about how he wanted disciples to orient themselves and position themselves to be able to be resources of blessing and healing to the world. And then he comes down from the mountain where he's given his Sermon on the Mount, and he actually begins to model the kinds of behavior he wants his disciples to live out. And he uses both his words and his touch to bring healing. And the first three miracles that we see are all to outsiders. They're in the first part of chapter 8. He goes to a leper who is an outsider because of his contagious disease, and he touches and heals him. He goes to a centurion who is an outsider because of his ethnicity. He's considered a Gentile. And and he heals his son. He goes to Peter's mother-in-law, who's an outsider because she's a mother-in-law. No, because she's a... <laughs> <laughs> because she's a woman. And in the ancient world, uh, women were not considered anything close to equal with men. And now Jesus begins to do something really unique. He's going to start focusing on tension on what it means to be a disciple. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And so we're going to pick up in um, Matthew chapter 8 and looking at beginning in verse 8. Is, Jesus saw the crowd around him and he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Uh, this I just have to tell you, this message needs to be rated D for direct, because Jesus' response hardly sounds encouraging. Foxes have dens, birds have nests, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Son of Man is Jesus' favorite title for himself. He actually uses it 30 times in the Gospel of Matthew alone. Another disciple came to him and said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, you ready? You're going to be very unsettled with Jesus' response. Follow me. Let the dead bury their own dead. As it turns out, following Jesus will challenge your notions, your expectations, your assumptions, and your priorities. Following Jesus will challenge your notions, your expectations, your assumptions, and your priorities. The first guy that comes up to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. It's interesting. A couple of things. One, first of it, it acknowledges that this person is a teacher of the law. The second thing is that when he looks at Jesus, he calls him teacher. He sees kind of a camaraderie there, I think. And, and when you look at the other followers of Jesus, not a lot of teachers in that group. And so there were tax collectors and there were fishermen and, and, and all these things, but, but not really so much teachers of the law. And what you need to know is in the Gospel of Matthew, we'll see this four more times before we get out of, out of Matthew's Gospel, is that whenever somebody calls Jesus teacher, they are not a disciple. 
People who call Jesus Lord are disciples. It sounds like he's making a really big commitment, but when you examine it a little more closely, what you start hearing is tones like this. Jesus, I've got really good news for you. I will, I will follow you wherever you go. <laughs> it's kind of like that, isn't it? Yeah. This is your lucky day, Jesus. I have decided to join the team. Wherever you go. And Jesus challenges him at a level that surprises us. Honestly, it's uncomfortable. It's unsettling. It might even be offensive. And what Jesus says, foxes have dens, birds have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He gets under something. And what he's saying, of course you will follow me wherever I go. Will you follow me whatever you have to go through? Because his assumption is, if I follow a guy like this, wherever I go, it's going to be pretty comfortable. It's going to be pretty convenient. The accommodations are going to be pretty good. And so if I follow Jesus, it's going to go well. And what Jesus is saying, my mission is such that there's not always great accommodations. Convenience is not my priority. My personal comfort is not why I'm here. I'm going to go places that are hard and challenging and difficult and may not even have have a place to lay my head, are you still up for the job? And isn't it true for us that when we think about following Jesus, it's very easy to say, I will follow you wherever you take me, as long as when I get there, it's good. I told Jesus at the beginning of my ministry, I said, because I, 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 this is what I heard. I heard a lot of pastors say they told God what they would never do, and then God made them do it. So I figured it out, and I told God, I said, I will never be a pastor of a successful and large church in Hawaii. I just won't do it. <laughs> and God said, you're right. <laughs> See, when things get tough, when the diagnosis is disappointing, when the relationships are strained or fractured, when the income isn't what is expected, when the, the job description changes or the job opportunity falls through. That's the whatever, not wherever. And are you willing to follow Jesus then? Because that's the challenge. And, and, and so this is what we have to understand. He's going to challenge our assumptions, our expectations, our notions, our priorities. Next guy up. Oh, Jesus, I'm going to follow you, uh, but... Uh, I need to go bury my father. And what you have to know is in ancient Jewish culture, that was such a high priority that it excused you even from your morning prayer. All, all Israelites prayed the same morning prayer. It began like this, Hear, O Israel, our Lord, the Lord our God is one. He said, if your father had died and, and you needed to take care of the burial, you don't even have to say that prayer. Just get about your business. And so he comes to Jesus and, and let me go bury my father first. First, let me go bury my father and then, then I will follow you. First of all, if his father was dead, why is he there? So his father may be ill or aging. Let's just check how many here are aging. And if your hand's not up, I've got bad news for you. And so what's the challenge here? And the challenge is, I have something that's more important than following you, but as soon as I take care of this, I'll do that. Now, Jesus' response almost sounds like he's a little bit callous or cares less about family members, but we're going to see in chapters to come in Matthew that the way Jesus thinks about honoring our parents actually exceeds what people who lived according to the dictates of the law. In fact, religious people in those days used the law as an excuse to not honor their parents, and Jesus doesn't tolerate that very well. The problem is not him honoring his father. The problem is who he puts first. And here's the thing you have to know. When, when something other than Jesus is first, everybody loses. 
Jesus, if he is first in your life, will make you a better spouse. He will make you a better parent. He will make you a better employer. He will make you a better employee. He will make you a better friend. He will make you a better whatever it is you're doing. But whatever else you put first, everybody loses. And Jesus says, following me is not about as long as everything's convenient and following me is not about when you're done with the stuff that's really important to you, you can come talk to me. Jesus doesn't think like that. And he doesn't respond like that. Following Jesus is not just a one-time decision. It requires an ongoing renewal because we're always going to be stepping into things that are not convenient and we're always going to be stepping into things that demand priority. How are we going to navigate this? When we put Jesus first, everybody benefits. Everybody in your life benefits. Now, let's look on because it looks like Everything changes, but Jesus is still going to teach us something about discipleship, only now he's going to model it out. He got into the boat with his dis and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Didn't he just say he had no place to lay his head? The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. And he replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds. He didn't rant at them. He didn't rage against them. He just rebuked them. And it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Which is the essential question of discipleship. Even the winds and waves obey him. He gets into the boat and he heads off. I love that Matthew identifies that Jesus is sleeping because one of the things Matthew loves to do is to bring both the divine nature of God and the human nature of Jesus into the same person. Well, is he fully God? Yes. Is he fully man? Yes. Why is Jesus sleeping? Because he's tired. Jesus is not laying there pretending to sleep to see how the disciples are going to handle this. Jesus didn't cause the storm to test them. Jesus also didn't prevent the storm to keep them from getting worried. He's actually asleep. And the disciples, this is a storm that is a significant storm. This isn't just moderately inclement weather. This is a very severe storm. The winds are absolutely howling, gale force, and waves are sweeping over the boat. And they've made an assumption. We're not going to make it. And they go to Jesus and they ask him to save them. What is this passage teaching us about discipleship? And this is really surprising to us because what it is teaching us, it is not just the uninformed regarding scripture or God's ways that need saving. It's not just the people who are struggling or who might be antagonistic to towards God's word that needs saving, disciples need saving too. We will be in situations that are too much for us. We will be in situations where the winds are more than we want and the waves are washing away things that are precious to us and we don't know if we're going to survive. And so what is the answer? And, and what happens is we become terrified. We panic. Anxiety is probably the most common experience of modern culture today. We all share what it feels like. And it can, the thing about anxiety is when you think it's bad, it can actually get worse. And so what, what, does, what do they do? They go to Jesus. And what does he, he answers the question before he asks it. Very uncommon thing to do. The question is, why are you afraid? But he answered it first, little faith. So, did Jesus say, get some more faith, come back to me, I'll see what I can do? Little faith is still faith. We beat ourselves up about this. In fact, sometimes we'll say, because things are not convenient for me, because I've got so, all these things pressing in around me, because I'm in a storm I'm in, it must be because my faith is so little or not authentic at all. And that is why God is not helping me in this situation. And I'll tell you what their faith was enough to do. It was enough to cry out to Jesus. That's a good thing to know. And so they did cry out to him. It, 
And, and what Jesus is saying is, is that faith is not just a, a signing on to a series of doctrinal truths or theological concepts. It's more about trust. Because God is not just in the same universe with us. God is not just on the same planet as us. God is not just in the same country as us. God is not just in the same ocean or the lake as us. God is in the boat with us. That's the message of Christmas, isn't it? Emmanuel, God with us. We can trust God because he's right here, right now. And if you can believe, even if it's just to cry out to him and you don't think anything is working, anything is helping, it's not going to go well for you. That in itself is still faith and little faith is still faith. How many are glad that Jesus doesn't wait for us to get to a certain level before he engages? Yeah. And then he rebukes. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't yell. He doesn't rant. He, he just, he says, well, one gospel says, peace, be still. Maybe he does what I did to my dog. <laughs> Instant calm. What kind of man is this? Even his words affect nature itself. Good question. When he arrived at the other side of the region of the Gatherings, the Gatherings is it's one of the 10 cities known as the Decapolis very highly populated. What's interesting is part of the, uh, uh, the population was Jewish and about another half were considered Gentile. And so it's a very mixed population. Once again, we see Jesus prioritizing reaching out to people right, who are outsiders. And two demon-possessed men come from the tombs and meet him. And they were so violent, they were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, Son of God? They asked two questions. This is the first one. What do you want with us, Son of God? They shouted. These, these guys are screeching. They're screaming. Blood-curdling screams. It would make you uncomfortable if I tried to reproduce the sound. Have you come here to torture us before our, our appointed time? And some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus. This word is important because it's going to show up again. If you drive us out and send us into the herd of pigs. And then he said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And then the whole town went out to meet Jesus. The whole town went out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded in Greek, it's the exact same word, they begged. They begged him to leave their region. See, every person experiences external storms, we know about that, but every person experiences internal storms, and the devastation can be even greater, though it's hard to show in B-roll footage on the news. These two men had a kind of internal storm that tormented them in a way that their only response was to torment others. They were so violent that there was a section of the town nobody would go. It was too risky. And they come out to Jesus and they ask two questions. And the first question is, what do you have to do with us? Uh, how, what, what are they actually saying? We have nothing in common. Why are you here? Now I know, especially to the modern mind, the idea of believing in some kind of malevolent, invisible spiritual force is considered uneducated, archaic, and, and foolish. Because we've learned now in modern society that we know all the causes to all the effects. 
And what I would tell you is, no, we don't. There's lots of things that are unexplained. And I actually don't look to science to help me with this realm because this realm is not scientific. Jesus doesn't just pretend to believe in demons, his enlightened self to make other people feel better because he doesn't want to discourage them or, or make them feel as though he's not on the right page. Jesus actually understands there are invisible forces in our world. It's not just nature. There's something else going on. It's not just natural. There's something supernatural. And so Jesus addresses the actual issue. Why are you here? We have nothing in common. And then it's, it's really a statement that they believe is true, but it's also an accusation. And then comes the second accusation through a question. How many of you have ever met someone who's really good at making accusations through questions? Yeah. Uh, so second, are, are you here to torture us before the time? Uh, as though that's what God does. He tortures people. Now, God does bring judgment. And when you're being judged, I'm pretty sure it's not comfortable. But here's the thing about judgment is no one thinks that now is the appropriate time. It's got to happen later. There was a herd of pigs nearby and the demons begged. Remember, they're screaming, they're shouting, they're screeching. It's, it, it's, it's an uncomfortable situation. And say, if you're going to cast us out, let us go into the pigs. And one word, <laughs> go. In the original Greek, move. <laughs> no long religious incantations, no, no long uh, spiritual arguments to try to dislodge a force that's so entrenched. That, that's not what's going on here. Jesus didn't respond to their accusatory questions. He didn't say a single word to any of them. But when they said, if you're going to cast us out, let us go into those pigs, his answer is, go. And what did they do? <laughs> they go. Let's see if I remember. I don't know if I can, but I'll try. An ancient song written by Martin Luther, the reformer of the Lutheran church. He was quite the hymn writer. Some of you raised in more traditional or uh, liturgical environments might remember the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Yeah? Though all the world with devils filled may threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God has willed. His truth will triumph through us. He says that the, the evil one, he, we don't have to fear him because we know that God is going to deliver us. And then it ends, the, the, the song, the verse ends with this phrase, one single word shall fell him. Go. What kind of man is this? And instantly, winds and waves calm. Go, and demons flee by the thousands. Every person experiences storms, externally and internally. What kind of man is Jesus? His disciples find that out. I'm going to have the worship team come out. When you look at the levels of faith as it appears, the, the guy who just kind of stands up and says, wherever, I'll go, sounds like a lot of faith. Uh, let me take care of my family first, sounds like lesser faith. We're all going to die, sounds like little faith. Two demonized men, no faith. Who does Jesus help? Everyone. Jesus doesn't respond to our need because our faith is great. He responds to our need because he is good. He's the savior of the world. He's the light that shines in the darkness. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's the strength we need when we have no strength less. If you're looking for a Jesus who guarantees you're going to be comfortable wherever you go, 
Jesus doesn't promise that. If you're looking for a Jesus that will always allow you to determine what the priority is of your life, Jesus is not going to accommodate that. If you're looking for a Jesus who will prevent storms so that you don't ever have to have a moment of anxiety, that's not the Jesus that we're talking about. But if you're looking for a Jesus who with a single rebuke can bring calm to the fiercest of storms and with a single word can cause devils to flee, that's the Jesus that we follow in Scripture and that's the Jesus we can follow right here, right now in our very real lives. So let's bow our heads this morning. Father, we're under it. We, we face it. And a part of us wishes you just make it easier. But would you help us see that the mission you've called us to is more important than our convenience or our comfort, that there's nothing more important than recognizing who you are and sharing that with others. In moments of fear, when we feel like we're disqualified from getting any help at all, even in our most fear-based language, you wake up, you get up, and you calm storms for us and for those who feel like they're completely out of control and the internal torment inside of them drives all of their behavior. You are the one who brings freedom and peace. I ask that you do that for each and every one of us today. In the name of the one we have chosen to follow, Jesus, amen. Let's all stand together.